Okay, a quorum being present, this meeting of the board's curriculum committee will come to order. Greetings to everyone here, um, board members, staff members, and um, the informational summary which describes the committee's last meeting has been provided. It does not require committee approval, so we'll move right into the first item of business, and I'll turn it over to Dr. McComas. So good afternoon, and thanks everyone for your time uh, today. If you look in your folder, you're going to see a list of curriculum committee dates for the next uh, school year, and um, we bring those forward for review and approval by the committee. These dates are based on our uh, historical pattern of, I think it's the third Thursday of the month. Uh, largely or the third the week in between the board meetings and sometimes that falls a little different depending upon when the first of the month is uh, but that's the historical pattern of when the committee meets and that's how these dates were selected is there any discussion anybody have any questions Do I have a motion for approval I'll make it. okay second all in favor okay great thank you that's good and then our next um, item for this evening is if I could invite uh, Mr. Imbarelli and Ms. Schubert and Mr. Stahl forward. Is Mr. Stahl joining you? I'm not sure if he's joining you for the, at the table. Okay. <laughs> uh, so what we have coming to the table is our magnet office team. And I know that we did a presentation on magnet programs in March, perhaps it was. It was, it, we were just talking about it, it was, it was, it was this winter. Okay, <laughs> and um, I wanted to bring that forward just to continue to build your education because I know magnet programs are something that our community at large is very interested in. There's high interest in our magnet programming. I know that as um, community leaders, our board members often in, uh, get questions about magnet programs. Um, and so we wanted to bring forward uh, kind of a deepening your understanding of the magnet program, the magnet process here in Baltimore County um, for your benefit. So this is really an informational presentation. So on that, I'll turn it over to the team. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so the first few slides, we're going to talk a little bit about the definition of magnet programs. We've, we've talked about it before, but it helps us frame the rest of the slides. Uh, we have a few maps, and then Leanne is going to talk a little bit about the Magnet Task Force. We haven't talked about that um, with this group of board members, and I think ha talking about the task force allows us to frame a discussion around where we stand now because of that task force that was begun in 2013, if I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the definition of magnet programs. There are 32 magnet schools and 116 magnet programs. Um, these have a diverse body of students. They come from obviously various socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds. Um, our guiding vision in Baltimore County is that magnet programs assist students in becoming globally competitive and provide unique, unique is really important in this part of this conversation, educational options aligned with interests, talents, and abilities. Uh, the magnet programs by definition are not available as comprehensive school program options. There are nearly 18,000 magnet students. I can actually tell you the exact number this year. There are 17,758 magnet students for uh, school year 18-19. It represents approximately 15% of the student population here in Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, and these students obviously benefit from academic achievement, diverse student enrollment, um, uh, cultural competencies that come from their programs, um, and what we see in these programs is high attendance rates, uh, graduation rates, um, and these programs come with innovative curricula and um, teaching staff that are often specialized in their particular areas. So the purpose of magnet programs is to provide uh, a viable public school choice option for our students. And um, as I mentioned before, provide unique educational environments with innovative programs um, and specialized programs of studies or experiences. And um, we do believe and uh, uh, can demonstrate that they do provide um, student diversity in the programs that we offer. Um, the programs are K to 12, so we have elementary, middle, and high programs. I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. And we try to fit our programs to community needs, um, to the needs that we're hearing from business and industry, and from higher education. There, uh, just to speak to that, there, there often, though, is a lag 
that occurs um, in building out a magnet program. And so it often can take a few years before we get the full program implemented and ensure that we have students who are in that program who have gone through the process of applying. So our, um, our elementary magnet programs, it's the smallest uh, of the three. There are four magnet elementary schools and there are two elementary magnet programs. Those are STEAM um, and those are international studies. Uh, and you can see here uh, from the map where, where those programs are located, those four schools. Our middle school magnet program, we have 12 magnet middle schools. Absolutely. You want me to go back to elementary? I was having a conversation with a teacher um, in my area, District 1. And I thought that she said in her school they have a new STEAM teacher. But I don't see that school on here. So what was the elementary school? Do you know? I want to say Lansdowne Elementary or Hillcrest, maybe? Is that? Uh, so so neither of those schools are elementary magnet schools. Um, STEAM is not a concept that is unique to magnet programs. Um, the program in itself, as Mr. Embrielli mentioned, is unique in that in its comprehensive nature. It's not offered at any of our other elementary schools, but the concept of STEAM may exist to some extent in, in many of our schools okay. currently. Okay, thank you, because I had not heard that term and now I'm hearing it, so okay, thank you. Ms. Mack, it could be a fifth special Mm -hmm. at that particular elementary school. Um, uh, th we do have a number of elementary schools who are exploring options for, for a fifth special. And, and so it could be a, a built out fifth special that may exist through staffing that that principal was able to identify. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and let me just take a moment to expand on the concept of STEAM is really uh, uh, the idea of integrating um, science, technology, art, you know, when they get into the STEAM, it's they're trying to make sure that we don't forget the artistic, aesthetic, design aspect of integration of these subjects. So it can take um, many forms when a school is looking at STEAM, and so if they have identified a teacher who's particularly talented in that integration, um, that's how they could, they could be innovative on their own, and they may have, you know, as a principal, you may have a teacher who's just really passionate about that integration and skillful, and you've seen their practice with children around it, and you're like, let's really optimize that. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Sorry. No, that's good. Oh, no, it's absolutely fine. Uh, so back to the middle school slide, there are 12, I think I mentioned, there are 12 middle schools that are magnet middle schools, and there are 31 magnet middle school programs. So um, at the magnet middle school level, these programs are an exploration model, and uh, so they prepare students for uh, multiple different pathway options at the high school level. Um, those could be both magnet or non-magnet because when students are in the middle school magnet program, they have options to go to their feeder, uh, feeder high school or potentially apply to um, multiple different high school magnet programs that they may be interested in. And our middle school themes range everywhere from health sciences to performing arts to law and finance, um, and there's uh, multiple other ones. Uh, there are um, most of those programs have aligned programs that exist in our high school magnets as well. So at our high school magnet programs, there are 16 magnet high schools, and there are 81 magnet high school programs that exist. And if you notice, um, each time we're showing the map, there's essentially more dots. <laughs> it begins to expand. As you see, there are more opportunities. So our largest pot of opportunities for students in the, in the school system for magnet does exist in the 9 through 12 grade range. And um, those programs uh, vary widely. I'm sure you have visited um, or have been in schools where you've seen our, our high school magnet programs. Um, they're everything from, tech, uh, from cosmetology to um, automotive service technology uh, to homeland security. Um, and uh, we have even centers that are and schools that are strictly magnet at the high school level. So there are three high schools, Carver, Eastern, and Western, that are 100% magnet students. Okay, so as Mr. Imbriali indicated, we wanted to talk to you a bit about um, the history behind the Magnet Task Force. Um, so in November of 2013, Medicine Associates reported the results of a six-month evaluation of magnet programs within BCPS. 
As a result of those findings, the Magnet Task Force was formed in December of 2013 with the goal of improving Magnet program effectiveness and the overall ability to promote equity and diversity within our Magnet schools. The task force worked on these goals, identified in a strategic plan, and you can see the roadmap up there, um, through June of 2018. And although the work groups that I'm about to talk about have come to a sunset, the work related to this still moves on within the Office of Magnet Programs. So the task force, when it was in place, was comprised of over 50 members representing Magnet students, parents, community partners. We had teachers on the work group, school administrators, and central office staff. And those work groups that are listed up here included equitable access, outreach and marketing and recruitment, the admissions process, administration oversight monitoring, and curricular and instructional standards. An additional work group was added in 2016 when BCPS entered into a voluntary resolution with the Office of Civil Rights based upon an investigation around students with disabilities and access to magnet programs. This uh, special education work group analyzes current magnet high school programs, assessments and admissions process, and works to ensure that all students, including our students with disabilities, have equitable access to our magnet programs. So we wanted to talk a little bit about what happened with this task force and what were the accomplishments under the, the work of these 50 folks. Um, we had many significant accomplishments over that five year time um, frame. A three zone model, which you actually saw on the maps that Mr. Embriali sh uh, shared with you, purple, the green, and the pink, was embraced with the eventual goal of ensuring that all elementary, middle, and high school programs would eventually be available in an east side magnet zone, a central zone, and a west side zone. We are not there yet, but this is the eventual goal with, with this. Um, the existing elementary magnet model was analyzed, and with community feedback, they were transitioned to the STEAM program that Mr. Embriali mentioned at Cromwell Valley and the Chatsworth School, and the International Studies model at Wellwood International and eventually Woodmore uh, Elementary. Eventually, these International Studies programs will become certified International Baccalaureate programs. Under the task force, we also established a magnet application process at the high school level, allowing high school students to apply for up to three programs regardless of location. In order to provide equitable access to middle school programs, we eliminated the criteria for middle school admission and At the high school level, BCPS established a process to fill all magnet seats available if seats remained open after students <coughs> scoring 80% and higher had been placed. BC BCPS began to work to transition the standardized and centralized high school magnet assessments. We used a zero-based budget form to categorize school magnet budget allocations and distributions. We continued to monitor expenditures tied to magnet programs. We monitored subgroup participation in all of our programs. We studied magnet space to assess equity of uh, magnet program space and also to better plan for magnet program expansion. And we had schools submit budget requests for all program expenditures. And finally, within that time frame, we also added the Stemmers Run International Baccalaureate Program. And the work continued. <laughs> we began to focus on students in grades six through nine with IEPs and 504s, helping to target and market and recruit to these families and these students, making sure that they understood that magnet programs are a viable option for them. We continued to refine that centralized and standardized magnet assessment process, starting with dance, literary arts, and culinary arts. We added quite an, a few new programs. At Milford Mill Academy, uh, performing and visual arts and literary arts were added. Western School of Technology, sports science was added. Woodlawn gained our early college high school program. George Washington Carver added the digital instrumental music program. Patapsco High School, literary arts. And Kenwood High School added the middle years program to their existing diploma program for their international baccalaureate program. We established a formal review of barriers to magnet access under the OCR voluntary resolution with a particular focus on our high school programs. We were thrilled to be awarded a $15 million federal grant, the Magnet Schools Assistance Program grant, that allowed us to add five new magnet programs and significantly reform one magnet program. And just this past spring, we served as the host district for the Magnet Schools of America conference uh, that was hosted April 11th through the 13th. 
So when we were here earlier this winter, we talked a little bit about that application process and the timeline. We wanted to share with you the school year 1920 timeline for magnet programs. Um, multiple magnet application events are held in the fall of each year to inform students and families of all of the magnet opportunities that are available and also to help walk them through that magnet application process. Each year, BCPS receives thousands of elementary, middle, and high school applications from thousands of students. To help you understand this, last fall, BCPS received 17,540 program applications from 7,045 students. That was for 2,737 seats. So 17, over 17,000 applications for 2,737 seats. So the timeline you see is really important to help inform parents of all of those options, support them in the process, and really help students explore whether it's at the elementary level, the middle school level, or the high school level, what these programs are and how they connect with their students' passion and future desires. I, I will say the one date that if, if you want to put this on your uh, calendars is the Magnet Expo, which is Saturday, September 28th, 2019. Um, it's a really wonderful morning and early afternoon experience and all of our magnet schools and all of our programs are showcased there. And uh, that includes um, performances, it includes uh, students uh, doing works of art, um, and it's a very, um, it's a great opportunity to see the programs as a whole in one location. Brian, what is the location this year? Is it a? Uh, it's the Red Lion? It Radisson? is the Red Lion, okay, that's what I was Red Lion Hotel, I think is what it's called now, in Timonium. <laughs> um, so at this point, were there any questions? Guys have questions? Go ahead. Anybody else? I do, but go ahead. Go ahead. Um, okay. First of all, I've said this many times. I'll say it again. My children are products of two of the three are products of Subbrook Magnet Middle, and all three are products of Western Tech. They were very well prepared for life, and they are very successful because of the education they got. So you would never have to sell me on magnet schools. Um, but that leads me to a question. Are we using every available magnet seat? So one of the changes I yeah. mentioned to you, the answer is yes. Um, one of the changes I mentioned was um, allowing students to fill seats below that 80% mark. So before that change, if um, we had uh, students apply for a program and we filled all of the seats with students scoring 80 above in the, in the random lottery and there were still empty seats, the remaining seats went unfilled. With that change to the rule, it then allowed us to go down to students who scored 79% and run a random lottery and fill seats, and 78% with the goal of filling with what you identified, Ms. Mack, as those highly valuable seats. So the goal there is to fill every possible seat in every program. The only time we wouldn't fill seats is when we have less applicants than we actually have seats. That happens occasionally, but it is few and far between. Okay. Um Recently, I think it was actually this week, there was an article in the paper about an audit that was done in Baltimore City of various programs that they offered to their students. And it was seemed to be a combination of CTE and some magnets. Um, do we ever audit the efficacy of our programs? Or, uh, like the outcomes, like if a student do we ever say we had X number of students who went to Western Tech's Culinary Arts and um, of that body of students, how many went on to utilize that as a career? Anything like that? Um, I'll defer to Mr. Sol, not to my knowledge, but. So we don't, as, an, as a magnet programs, program, monitor that type of, of performance. The schools themselves do to some extent. Um, one of the programs are career technology education programs. That office monitors some of that, or where the students go. Um, truly, the programs aren't intended necessarily for students who are oriented towards one particular career goal or another. It's to align with what their interests are at that time. You know, and sometimes we'll find that students will get into a program, they'll think it's one thing, they'll get the, gain that experience, and they'll realize that that's not really the career direction that they want to take. 
And so we feel that that's a, an informative thing for the students as well and important for them to know. Okay. Ms. Mack, were there are certifications attached to a particular program, right. um, most of that, most of the time those are through CTE, the Career and Technology Education right. Office. We, we do have the number of students who are able to obtain a certification. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, just one more question. I think when my children attended Sudbrook, there was, there were a list of things that they had to meet. Um, I, did I hear you say that middle schools now are full lottery? That is correct. So are there any academic um, levels or behavior or attendance levels that kids have to meet or anybody who applies can be considered in the lottery? All of our uh, middle school magnet programs are lottery based. Okay, thank you very much. I know. Coincidentally, last night the Southeast Area Advisory Council met and they uh, bombed me with a bunch of magnet questions. <laughs> uh, I didn't, I don't have my notes with me, so I'm going to try to put this together. Uh, the staffing piece of this, uh, how does that play into it? I, I mean, like, high school gets its, gets its staffing, standard staffing for the, uh, the comprehensive high school. And then the magnet piece, what's the formula or how do they do that? Yeah, so I can speak to that a bit. Um, a year in advance, Mr. Stoll and I work with the Department of Research and Accountability to look at projections. And those projections are based, um, as Mr. Embriale shared, magnet programs by definition have to draw students across an attendance boundary, right? So those would be students who weren't zoned to attend that school but are now coming to that school. We work with DRAA to share those numbers and those data. So as there's an increase in student enrollment, we then share that data with human resources who can adjust staffing accordingly. So as more students come into a magnet program, staffing is adjusted. So student enrollment drives magnet staffing. Okay. Now the monetary piece of it. So how does is there X number of dollars per each student in the program, or do they go by the program itself? Sure. So we receive uh, an allocation of funding to use to support the magnet programs and the ongoing costs, basically the maintenance of effort. Um, we allocate that money per pupil. So at the elementary school, it's $90 a, a, per, a student. Um, at the middle school, it's $145 a student who's participating in the magnet program. And at the high school, it's $225 a student currently. Um, so okay. we allocate that funding out, and then if we have additional funding remaining, then we use that. We, we refer to that as a holdback fund, and schools can submit proposals to replace outdated equipment or other materials that they need in order to support their program that they wouldn't use on a daily basis, things to replace mm -hmm. equipment okay. or, or a new initiative. Okay, and when I met with, with you guys there a week or so ago and we talked about those numbers, of course I don't have those numbers in front of me, <laughs> but if I remember correctly, specifically high school, the numbers, and somebody could pull up that email, there were 4,200 applicants in a high school for 2,500 positions, uh, if I'm remembering. And then out of that, there was a phrase undersubscribed and, and I quoted that to the, to the members of the council, and they questioned me on that. So there were 4,200 applicants in that email for 2,600 high school positions, and it was anticipated that 1,900 and some would be filled due to this undersubscription. So, I don't, so that's a 600 different difference in the, in the number of seats and actually how many kids are filling those seats. Remember that? Can you pull up that email? Yeah. I can find it on my phone, but that just caught me what... So, and, and didn't you say, Lisa, when you looked at the, at the capacity of these schools? Right, that's why... I... They were, the capacity's higher than the actual number of kids? Well, that's what prompted my question, because um, when we first got our students count book, I looked at Eastern Tech, Western Tech, Carver, and Sudbrook. They were just the four pure magnet schools that I knew about. And when I compared the seats, 
and how many seats were filled, I came up with a deficit of 340. Yeah, that's that's actually, actually correct. Yeah, so we, oh, okay. that's something we looked at this year <laughs> okay. and actually proactively, um, we um, met with the schools to address that. And so remember if, and I'll use an easy number, if a school is 100 uh, seats shy of their state rated capacity with their magnet seats, um, that doesn't mean they can take 100 seats next year as their freshmen. They would take 25, and then each year additional students um, would be added. And we actually are working with those schools you mentioned to bring their magnet seats closer to that state-rated capacity because, as you indicated, those are highly valued seats. Right, and that's why I asked that question because I wasn't sure if I was counting the right thing, but I thought that's 340 seats. When you have a waiting list, I know every year I've been involved with Western, there was a waiting list. Why aren't we filling every one of those seats? So the, the nuance, I think, in the no, conversation, there is a nuance, right. the nuance in the conversation is each of the programs in each of our magnet schools um, have set the number of students that they accept each year into that program. So. Um, you have a freshman class come in that then becomes a sophomore class, a junior class, senior class. So that builds over time. And so each program, when, when we're talking about our um, acceptance and like we'll then go down to 79% run the lottery, go down to 78% run. It's still about the number of seats allocated in the program. But do you ever so say to a child, you can't come to Western for culinary but we do have some seats open in environmental science, or that just doesn't happen. They have to apply they have, for the yeah. program. Oh. So that's, and that, you know, again, <coughs> I'm applying and I want to do, you know, law, and I want to do <coughs> international studies, but you're saying, well, they're filled, but I can offer you cooking. Um, that's not what I applied for. And so the priority goes to the students who apply for that program for cooking. And also remember, at the high school level, there are assessments linked to that. No, program, I know right? that, right. So we're filling all of our available program seats, but that that but we still are working to address the capacity issue at some of our schools. So there, I'm does glad that make to hear sense? That. That's yes. the nuance. There's two mm -hmm. different things happening. And as um, as Leanne mentioned, we are. We, we literally just in the last month started working with our high schools that have been identified in that way to build out a plan to ensure we've got the program seat part down. <coughs> now we've got to make sure that the, the, whole, the school as a whole <coughs> is growing to meet the difference in capacity that we're finding. Okay. I think part of um, part of the work of the task force, and Mr. McMillian, here's that email I found, so you can reference it as you need to. Um, part of the evolution here in Baltimore County with magnet programs, as you can see, is we're trying to expand because there is great demand. And part of the history of our magnet programs, just as we touched upon, we've moved to a lottery system um, versus uh, uh, an application um, right. sort of criteria base, is that the magnet programs were really designed, like when we think about this 80 point cut line, right? They were designed to kind of exclude, right? To limit. And we are, because there is such demand, pressing to try to get what has been historically a very exclusive mm -hmm. um, culture and opportunity to expand that opportunity because we know the community has great demand and 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 we want to give opportunity to those students right I mean especially when you think about what's the difference between a student who got 80 and a student who got 79 but you know so that is part of this um, sort of evolution here of our magnet programs and I think it's it's so important that's why I want to bring another presentation for all of you because it is complex but we know our community has great demand they want these opportunities for kids and we are working to try to build out not only more programs but also optimize the programs that are in place and some of that is shifting mindset shifting practice over time um, people always get a little nervous that that will dilute the student population it will dilute behaviors it will dilute achievement um, but that in fact is not what we have found um, we found that when we give students these opportunities because they are engaging and they are rigorous and they are very relevant that 
um, students thrive. Mm -hmm. um, and so some of that quite genuinely is sort of shifting what has been historical practice and historical mindset um, to meet the growing demand across the county. 17,000 applicants to 2,000 seats. So we need to expand our um, opportunity here for students. It, it will also, um, part of why I, I love that you're also interested in that you get so much engagement from the community because it is in demand, is this comes, you'll, we'll work through this with the budget process because we'll be asking for additional funds to help expand magnet programs. Um, and uh, you've been through that budget process and it, it's not just a matter of me convincing a superintendent to add it to the budget request, but then it's a matter of the superintendent and I convincing the board to keep it in the budget request, and, and then convincing the county executive to keep it in the budget request, and, and convincing the county council not to cut it from the budget request. So I just lay that out to all of you because we are together in this demand of 17,000 applicants to 2,000 opportunities. So thank you. I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> And, and those numbers kind of throw me a little bit because here's the, the email and it states 4,200 students applied for high school magnets. 2,574 high school seats were open. Because some programs are undersubscribed, we expect to fill 1,994 seats. So back to the 17,000 applicants for 2,000 seats. I don't follow that because I'm seeing here for the high school there was 4,200 students for 2,500 seats. So I'm, I'm just con confused on those numbers and what the undersubscribe piece means. So it, it, it looks like 2,500 seats were open. We expect to fill 1,900 seats. So that's almost 600 seats that don't appear to be filled. So can you explain that piece? So the 17,000 is when we look at all magnet programs okay. for the whole district. And what you just cited was referencing just high school. Okay. Okay, so that's part of the answer there. Okay, okay. and to get that, so, seven, so I've heard twice, 17,000 seats, or 17,000 applicants for 2,000 seats. But then the high school alone is 2,500 seats. Mm -hmm. So how does that? So Mr. McMillian, I... I can't give you an answer sitting right here exactly what those seats are, but I would like to go back with my team and look at those data and un get you a better answer of exactly where those unsubscribed seats so we can differentiate. Yeah. And what does numbers? that mean, unsubscribed, so, undersubscribed? So that means if a school has a program with 25 seats and only 20 students apply for the program, yeah. five seats would be left open. Okay. And uh, mm -hmm. so I can... Well, Dr. Well, McCombs yeah, we'll can send you this up. email. So. Yeah. <coughs> well, and we worked with the Magnet Office to get those responses right, for you. Right. So they'll go back to the email. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and then something like the Kenwood piece. 39 students applied for the IB. 35 seats. Mm -hmm. 10 students accepted placement offers. So does, does that mean, uh, so out of those 39, 10 took those spots. So that leaves 29. So those other 29 kids took a different magnet spot someplace? Very possibly, that yes. That is possible, yes. Okay. And that is an example of under undersubscribed. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's also a great example of why we built out the middle years program at Kenwood and why we're building out the IB programs on the east side for the feeder schools that feed to Kenwood. So when we come back to you, these numbers are only going to increase and we're not going to see it be undersubscribed. That's the goal. Because for so many years, Kenwood uh, lived as an island with that IB program. And so now if we can, if we can create more like a Hawaii, then <laughs> it gives us more opportunity to make sure we get all of these schools feeding into Kenwood so that IB program can really grow. Right. So did, Ken, did Stemmers Ryan get there okay? Are they not, still waiting to hear? We've not yet heard. Okay, so we're still waiting to hear. So Middle River's going through that process yep. for maybe next year. Okay. Uh, Can I uh, just ask yeah, a question about what you're saying? So anytime you go to sign up for a class like yoga, they say we will only run the class if we get 25 people because it's not cost effective to run it with any fewer than 25 people. So when we have a class that we have used the magnet Mm -hmm. per pupil mm -hmm. headcount funding mm -hmm. and we're counting on 39 and we get 10 
we were paying a pretty high price, even though I think all, there should only be 10 kids in all class, that would be great. But do we factor that cost in that we, because there is a cost to having those empty seats. So the magnet funding isn't based on projected enrollment, it's based on actual enrollment for the current year. So we take oh. what their current enrollment is, do a per pupil allocation for next school year. Mm -hmm. If there's a significant increase in funding, then we can use some of those holdback funds to add to that. But if it remains pretty constant from pro year to year, typically, for most programs, so that funding is enough to support the program for the upcoming But year. what happens if in all previous years you had 39 kids in that program, but this year you have 10? So, like I said, the, the funding that we provide is based on the current enrollment. We, we use that as the calculation for next year's funding because we don't know exactly mm -hmm. what next year's enrollment is going to be by the time that we have to put in the money for the funding, right? So when we have to submit that to the budget office for what that amount is going to be. Um, we don't withdraw money from schools, but like I said, for most programs, year to year, the enrollment stays pretty consistent. Okay, thank you. Mr. Offerman, did you? Yes, uh, I, I was involved in the magnet program, in, in the uh, beginning of the magnet program for law and uh, public policy at Towson decades ago. I can't even tell you when. Uh, the thing, that, uh, one thing that amazed me, and as a counselor at that time too, was that uh, we had, uh, we would bring in 60 kids uh, typically at, at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, how few kids left? These were kids that had spent their whole career in their home school districts in the district before. Mm -hmm. They come, in some cases, in our case it was uh, Liberty Road, I think, all the way to, you know, to, to like 95. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we had kids, you know, and, and uh, are, are, there, are, you, are there any significant numbers of kids going back, going back from the magnet programs after they've, you know, early in the year or sometimes in the first year? Yeah, like attrition. So you're talking about students withdrawing and going back to their right. home schools? Right. Uh, the numbers of voluntary withdrawals of students is relatively small across our programs. Most right. of the students, once they get in, mm -hmm. um, they want to be successful. They want to continue the program because they're entering programs that they truly have an interest in. Right, and that's and I, and, and, and that's what I experienced at Towson. And uh, just sort of as a sidebar, uh, I, I think that the kids that were in the law and public policy program got were able to develop communication skills and research skills, and particularly. Uh, 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 effective in uh, in public speaking skills because of programs they were in that would serve them well no matter what they did as a mm -hmm. career. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I, they were, you know, regardless. So, uh, I was lucky enough that my younger son went to Eastern, had a phenomenal experience there. Uh, you know, probably changed his life in terms of education completely because of what, what, what was there that way. I do have one other comment to make, and it's and I know I, I'm not trying to. Uh, make your life more miserable, but uh, there was a case at Towson, and this is when the schools did their own selecting, literally. I mean, there was no countywide control mm -hmm, of this way right. back then. I had a boy come in over the summer his freshman year who was perfect for the law and public policy program. I mean, he was, you know, he, he had tremendous interest. His father was a lawyer, tremendous interest. Uh, his father had gone to Towson, so there was this knowledge of the family. And I was able, at that time, to, to, to put him in the program yeah, I'm sure that's not being done now, I'm assuming. If somebody doesn't get in in grade nine, they're, they're not entering late. Is that correct? A few of our high school programs do take applications for the 10th grade year, oh. but it is a complete restart. So the application wouldn't carry from ninth grade over mm -hmm. to 10th grade. Okay. Um, and some of our students do do that. That's not all of our programs, but okay. there are some 10th grade entrance well, opportunities. Well, uh, I'm actually glad to hear that because not, not everybody is in Baltimore County Public Schools in ninth grade or you know, some magnet interest in in, uh, in six, seven, or eight. But uh, you know, I, I think that's important that, that that we recognize and 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 help those kids or try to give those kids an opportunity. Uh, I don't think it was great to have a school-based control of that. Looking back on it, but there was there was no other control at that time. So, you know, <laughs> right. I would sit with a magnet coordinator, with Janice Mabry, and and I called her and. And, you know, and 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 work. I had all his data and all his you know, and he he fit perfectly and very successful uh, three years at Towson. And you know, uh, I was happy I, I could do that. But I was wondering what the situation was now. Thank you. Yeah, I think just I just like to comment that um, that's a great example. Thank you for sharing that with us of how many of our magnet programs over 
time, and I'm talking ex you know decades of time, have come up into inception. It may be ha may have been the initiative of, of a principal who wanted to see a specialized program develop, um, and so. You can see, again, there's a, a growth and an evolution over time. And where we are at this point in time as a community is that there is great demand, and we are trying to open access so that um, there would be law on the east side, the central right. side, the west side, right. so that um, a student wouldn't be prohibited because maybe their parents can't get them there, right? right? Um, they, they were some of the barriers that uh, create, um, you know, exclusion of students <coughs> who may have true talent and interest, right. um, but, you know, logistics would be an obstacle to prevent that opportunity. So. Just again to see how the community at large has evolved and how magnet programs came into place. Um, the gatekeepers of how people got into the program um, and where we are in that journey today in our equity work around providing greater access to students programming because we know again students and parents want these relevant rigorous programs. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, but I just, no, that's okay. I just want to, I want to take care of this. So back to the IB, so 39 students applied, 35 seats, 10 students accepted placement offers. So 35 seats, that's freshmen coming in. Correct. Possibility. So technically over four years, there could be 140 kids in that program. That is correct. correct. Any idea how many there are after they graduated? Is that something we'd have to look up? Yeah, we don't. Okay. Want okay, to. that's fine. Mm -hmm. Now, but we can get we can get you that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was just curious, and with the transportation piece, so do the 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 three magnet exclusive high schools? They have transportation available to them all over the county, or how does that piece work? So if a kid, suppose a kid, Randallstown kid wants to go to Eastern Tech, and he gets accepted in that. Does he get transportation from Randallstown to Eastern Tech? No, so each school has a defined magnet transportation boundary. Okay. And most of those were established when the programs themselves were established. So some of them were established back in the early 1900s. Um, 1900, 1999, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm thinking, anyway. Um, <laughs> it seems like that long, <laughs> but uh, and, and some of them are that antiquated, but they, they've perpetuated and they've existed since that time. So we have some school, at the high school level, the transportation patterns seem to be much broader. So a school on the east side would transport typically from the entire east side. A school on the west side transports primarily from the west side. Um, and central schools typically transport from the majority of the district. Uh, there's some exceptions to that, but that's typically how the high school patterns work. When you work your way down f to middle school, it's much more restrictive. Right. So we'll have some schools that will transport from one or two other schools and some that will transport from a larger number. It, at one time, I think Long Green Pike was the cutoff for Eastern Tech. That's just something that sticks out in my mind. So it sounds like from, from Long Green Pike East, then they had transportation. Uh, so, so just to clarify, so the, the example that Mr. McMillian used, how is that Randallstown kid getting to Eastern Tech? So there's two options for a student that lives outside of the transportation zone for a magnet program. Right. One option is that the parents can get their student to a bus stop, the closest bus stop for that school. Right. Um, and if there's room on that bus, then they can take advantage of that bus route. But the parent has to get them to the nearest bus stop. The other option is the parent drives the student to the school. When when I was principal at Patapsco High School, um, the furthest west transportation hub stop was Lock Raven High School. Right. But I had a large contingency of students from the Randallstown area. And so those students were either, as, as Mr. Stoll mentioned, they would either come to that Lock Raven stop and parents would have a system, or for me at Patapsco, they would come right through the city, either by bus, or their parents would bring them. But again, I, I want to come back to Dr. McComas's point about the long-term goal of this east, central, and mm -hmm. west side zone. 
our goal is to not put families in that position. Right. So if, if a program existed at a high school in each of those zones with zone transportation, then we don't put families in the position of having to make that very difficult choice. And for some of our families, that's not a choice. So again, that is part of that long-term mm -hmm. three zone goal. And, and to go back to my example, uh, it's actually one of the reasons we have Milford Mill Academy now on the west side. Okay, so to the uh, cosmetology numbers, there was 600 and some kids applied for like 60 positions. And, you know, at Eastern Tech at one time they had it, they stopped it. Uh, now Carver's in the central area and has it. Is there any chances that Eastern Tech in the next five years is going to get cosmetology back or is that just something that's gone and it will never come back? So the cosmetology program on the east side currently is at Sellers Point right. Technical. So again, for students living on the east side, they have access. Cosmetology is actually a great example where we have an east side school, a central right. school, and a west side school that have that program available, thus providing access regardless of a student zip code. Okay, and the difficulty with adding more seats there is the stations. Correct. Right, okay. Uh, now, how, uh, Pete Dixit makes a comment, and I was specifically asking him about that, on, on from design to ground, to, to walking into ribbon cutting, walking in the door on an elementary school is three years, a middle school is four years, a high school is five years. If you decide that you want to expand a program or start a new program, how far from the design piece to the actual implementation of that program do you project or do you plan into? So question. one of the things I mentioned to you in the work of the Magnet Task Force was a space utilization study and understanding uh, for a program like cosmetology, what do the existing spaces look like? What is the ideal for those spaces? So you mentioned in cosmetology there are actual workstations for students, right? So then it, we've worked with Mr. Dixit's team to be at the table. So when we're looking at a new school and we're looking at the three zones and existing magnet programs and perhaps where there's a gap, that space study allows us to say, oh, look, this particular program is not present um, in this zone and this is the space requirement. So having us at the table from the very beginning with that team to um, understand the vision for that school and how Magnet can be a part of that conversation. To be specific, there are programs that cost a lot more than others because of the construction or the design that's necessary. So uh, automotive bays are going to be in a completely different experience from a space utilization standpoint than um, p potentially looking at um, an international studies program that could eventually be an IB program. It's a completely different um, discussion and plan because of what we need to do. D you know, dance, a dance studio fits into the same conversation as the automotive, although the automotive would be really difficult. But the, the da dance is also, it, it involves construction, that floor, all those challenges. So it does depend program to program. The, the law program at Towson needs classrooms, mm -hmm. like standard, everyday classrooms. So it's a much different experience than the bays in a cosmetology program. Uh, there was a courtroom yeah. uh, th Correct. that was constructed yes. at Towson, Correct. and that took, yeah, th we they did that over, basically over over one summer, I believe. Mm -hmm. But again, that was that was taking a double classroom and turning into a, you know, so they, so they took a wall out and, and, and they utilized everything else they had, and, and then they put a raised, much like this, in fact, mm -hmm. that, that way, so, it, so it set is up there to work from. But that's all they really needed to do at Towson. Yep. And I'm almost done here. On the standard, on the testing, the centralized testing, the Southeast Advisory Council, they were upset that they no longer tested like dance for Patapsco at Patapsco. Mm -hmm. And they centralized that at Carver, correct? So or currently dances, uh, dance assessments um, for the past two years have been available at all of the sites. Um, the difference with dance is that if a student applied to Patapsco, Carver, and Milford Mill, they would only have to assess once at the site of their choice. Okay, so if they, if they tested, if they applied only to Patapsco, then they didn't go to the Carver setting. It was they their choice could. where they went. <laughs> Excuse me? Yeah, it they, was their choice where the student assessed. If, if Patapsco was easier for them to get to, they right. could assess there okay. or they could assess at Carver or Milford. Okay, so they kind of misled me on that. Uh, 
which I've been misled a few times uh, over my life. Uh, if I may, Mr. Okay. McMillian, it, that's, a, I think, uh, and I'm sure they did, had no in, malintent. I think it's, it's really a good example of how, you know, it, this is why it's so important for you to understand sort of like this evolution, right? Because schools, you know, are upset when, like, we used to create our own assessment. And now you're saying we have to have a consistent assessment with all the schools that have the same program, which is a fair and equitable process for students across the entire county. And I think it's one of those things, you know, whenever a community feels like somehow they've lost something, even though it's not that they've lost something, it's shifted, right? It's now, instead of just my own personally developed assessment, it's now the standard for across the whole district. And so the magnet um, topic is, is very um, involved because of that ownership that people have and how we, when we're looking at the good of the whole county, are looking at how do we make sure that this is fair access. So I just wanted to kind of yeah. expand so on that. I, I just want to be square. So a, a dance kid at Patapsco that has applied specifically for Patapsco is not interested in any other program, that child tests at Patapsco. If they choose to uh, go unless there. Unless they, they want to go there. Correct. Be because these people say that, you know, some of the Southeast area kids went to the Carver setting. They watched. Can, can they actually watch the, the dances? Are they secluded? The, the, the audition piece of it? So there are portions of the audition that are a group assessment, but um, you could as the non-dancer in the room, I guess the only way you could watch would be if you were watching while you were dancing for your audition at the same time. There are no observers in the assessment, so to speak. Okay, so if a, a Patapsco child went to Carver to test, it would be the child and the observers and, and the testers. And the testers. Correct. And Correct. nobody else. Correct. Okay. Okay, and I think that that's, I think that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, one, on, this, on this task force, mm -hmm. is that on our website that they can go to and, down, and, and hit that link and see that, the information that you shared with us here a couple minutes ago? Um, there is information on our website about the Magnet Task Force, um, not specifically the information that was shared in tonight's presentation. Okay. That would be on the curriculum. Thank you very Friday. much for your time. Mm -hmm. And as always, as you have more questions or questions from um, your constituents, you can always email me and my team and I will work together to get you responses. And if there's follow-on questions, um, we'll work through those as well. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. your thank you. Thank you. Your support. Um, so I'm sorry, Ms. Mack, do you want me to just keep the program moving? <laughs> my instinct is to just um, move things. OK, so our next uh, topic for um, information, and really, um, again, to help bring our, our board members um, up to current understanding and Ms. Shea, if you could come forward and talk to us a little bit about vocabulary programming. Good afternoon. Um, I actually have several resources. Um, so the good news is I'll be quick, which is not typical for me. <laughs> um, so the first resource that I want to talk to you about is a resource called vocabulary.com. This is actually a resource that was brought to the board in April of 2018 as a new contract. Um, and it will be coming back to contracts committee um, for a spending authority increase. And I wanted to come back to sort of update on what vocabulary.com is since we had a transition, of course, in the members of the board, but then also to um, explain why we're looking to increase it. So it is a digital platform that's used to support word learning aligned to research. Um, and it, the research specifically is around multiple exposures. And so when we talk about vocabulary learning, we really want kids to know a word in multiple ways. So we want them to know it in context, out of context. We want them to understand it in relationship to other words, so as synonyms or antonyms. Um, and the research is really clear that in order for a student to actually know a word, or what they um, often say, own a word, if you will, um, they have to have multiple exposures in many different ways. And so what this platform allows is for um, teachers, um, and the license itself actually for the student and every teacher in the building. So it's used all day, any day, from any content. 
Um, and what they can do is they can actually um, take any piece of text that they are going to be using for class. So let's say we're, we just came recently with our new science textbooks. And let's say there's a particularly challenging passage that students are going to be using. The teacher can actually upload a passage from that text. And this um, program will pull out the academic vocabulary words that are critically important. And then we'll give them to the students in multiple contexts in a way that the students are practicing them, quizzing themselves, um, competing in what we call um, word jams, where they can compete with other students. Um, so it's able to be generated by the teachers for the students. Students can also use it to create their own lists. So I have a rising junior who um, has already started using it to build SAT word lists for herself. Um, so there are resources for the kids to kind of make the learning their own, but also for the teachers to use it. Um, and what's been really exciting for us is to see um, how motivated our kids are. We sometimes offer what we call word jams um, within the county. So we'll put out an all call and tell the students. Um, and we'll have kids from Deep Creek Middle playing against kids from Perry Hall Middle, playing against kids from all over the state, um, which is really exciting because um, I'm a word nerd personally. And I like to see the kids get excited about something like vocabulary because I know how to their literacy skills over time and their content knowledge. Um, this is some of our data over time. So this is the growth in words mastered by weeks. Um, so you can see we had 36 schools that were using it with um, over 400 teachers, which speaks to some of that interdisciplinary use that I mentioned. So we see social studies teachers using it, math teachers. Um, and so they answered over 10 million questions, and they mastered 374 a little bit more um, words. And again, to determine mastery meant that the student had to be able to see it in multiple contexts and be able to um, use that word. So it previously was brought as a contract, and I know this is not the contract committee, but this is just my way of kind of re-bringing it back to talk about that um, what we're hoping to do is to have increased spending authority so that we can use it in all schools, including our high school. So when I mentioned that we had 36 schools, we had currently been using it in middle school and then um, some of our high schools. So we used some of our high schools that were feeder patterns with our middle school students so that as they left eighth grade, they could continue that use. Um, we've heard from a lot of our high school students, and certainly an analysis of our PSAT and SAT data indicates that um, vocabulary knowledge continues to be an area we need to focus on, um, as well as across contents. And um, so we are hoping that the increase in spending authority will allow us to um, purchase it for students in every school. And um, this is a part of money that we have in our operating budget in the Office of ELA, so it's not a new request but rather um, a different use, if you will. Um, and I figured we, I would get asked about the cost per student, and so it is $4, and that is for the student to use it for the whole year in any content area. And then as soon as we do that for the license for the school, again, um, all the teacher licenses are included. We've done professional learning um, with English chairs and English teachers as part of our professional study. We did that last summer, and we'll offer it again this summer. Um, we have also offered optional vocabulary.com trainings as part of other opportunities for professional learning as choice. Um, and we have done training at department chair meetings in some of the other content areas, including social studies, I believe, math and science. So that's vocabulary.com. <laughs> Yeah, I know if we'll open it up for questions, but I just wanted for clarification, uh, I put this in the information section because as you see, it, we, this has already been approved by the curriculum committee and the full board, And but it, you will see a contract coming forward. I don't know, is it in July, August? I believe it is still on the agenda. Um, for and so, <laughs> so you will see this contract, but I wanted to make sure that you understood the history of this um, and that it has already been approved for its curricular purpose and curricular standards. Um, I would just like to also so add that um, you know vocabulary work is one of the research-based best practices if you read and I wouldn't expect any of you to but if you do Robert Marzano this is really vocabulary um, work in all its forms is one of the high leverage strategies to help with student achievement so any questions sorry no not for me Okay, great. So then I'm going to move on. Again, this is one that you'll say this um, feels like deja vu, and it does. So I have talked to you several times about our Striving Readers Comprehensive Literacy Grant. And so just to quickly refresh your memory, these bullets list um, the requirements that we had to be able to qualify for those grant funds. As you're, This will probably be 
bringing back some memories of other presentations. One of the requirements was that at least 15% of our grant allocation had to serve students birth to five. And so we, as you will recall, we um, did this through our comprehensive literacy plan through a program called Raising a Reader. Um, if you remember, I brought red bags full of books. <laughs> Um, and so the, just to kind of, again, as um, Dr. McComas said, this has already gone through the approval process, but um, Dr. McComas had asked me to bring it just as a reminder because it will be coming back in the same way for a spending authority um, increase. Raising a Reader um, was specifically designed to help families establish routines for reading at home. So it's a service that we, the teachers provide trainings to um, families, so parents and caregivers with, um, and we use our pre-K students, our four-year-olds, um, to help develop those really rich literacy routines that we know are so critical to developing a lifelong habit of reading. Um, and so they practice each week, they take these books home, and then they have an opportunity as a lending library. If um, and as, also as part of the grant work, we partnered with the um, county library so that we teach this routine through school, and then we transfer that routine through the public library at home. And so these are some of the goals. It's just um, really about developing those habits and then helping to teach our parents um, how to read with their child in a way that's going to create that um, literacy building, that oral language fluency, um, and then helping with that maintenance to connect as well. Um, and so what we're excited about is when we brought the original contract, um, we had a very specific amount of money that we'd been given in the grant. But we've recently learned that um, we have other grant funds with um, available within some of our early childhood grants. And as you know, um, through previous budget conversations, we're always growing in our pre-K classrooms. Um, but we're right up against where we were. So the spending authority will just allow us to continue to offer this as we expand um, using some of those other grant funds that we um, have available. Sure. I'm sorry. Could you go back to the first slide, please? I sure can. This one? Or this one? This one. Sure. Oh, uh, where's the other 5%? Oh, so that's for um, managing the grant, uh, if you fine. will. Thank you. That's a, thank you so much. <laughs> yep. Good There's math, a lot though. of work There's to my managing math. federal and state <laughs> grants. There's like, there, that takes almost a whole person you got full it. time right. to make sure everything's appropriate, which, of yeah. course, is what we want. Okay. Right. So. <laughs> but I would expect no less from our math teacher Thanks. that he did that addition. <laughs> and you're a numbers person, too. So. I am, but that didn't cross my mind. Uh, my, my question is a numbers question, yep. though. Um, well, specifically, how are you getting parents involved? Mm -hmm. And then numerically, what is the participation rate? Yep. So we have, um, we the participation rate in the training um, was very high. I can get you the specific numbers, but we offered this through our pre-K pre -K classrooms. So we had parent nights in our pre-K classrooms um, where the pre-K teachers were trained first by raising a reader, which was part of what the grant funds, and then with our early child. Um, office as well as our Judy centers at some of our um, at Camfield and at Hawthorne. Um, we had parent nights at each of these um, schools that had pre-K. We started with our Title I schools um, that have pre-K programs in them. And so um, we had the um, Raising a Reader family workshops at every school. So there was 100% participation in terms of the schools. Um, I can get you some specific numbers about how many parents came in each school. I don't have that with me. What I can tell you is that at the end of this year, we did a survey and we had had over 600 parents return the survey, which is a great number. Um, of those 600 parents, 74% indicated that they saw an increase in their child's reading behavior. 60% um, of them said that they um, now had a reading routine that before they did not. Some of the parents said they already had one, and this just continued. Um, but we had over 60% say they didn't previously have a home reading program, and that through this program, um, and then we got a lot of anecdotal comment feedback about parents just enjoying the time to read to their child and to learn how to read to their child. And what I mean by that is um, pointing out different things that connect to what they're learning in school and also um, building on that really important oral language skill that we know is so critical for early childhood development. So we were really excited. 600 is a lot to get back from a parent survey, and I think that speaks to the interest in the program. Hopefully that will also, we'll start to see some of the impact in our KRA data now. That's a, a full assessment and there'll be plenty of students who have not participated sure. in this opportunity. Um, but that would help lead to kindergarten readiness. Right, so. absolutely. We would hope. Anecdotally, I 
my husband has a degree in English literature, and I, I'm a word nerd, too. So we read Great. to our kids all the time and read to them so much that they memorized the books. Yep, absolutely. And my dad was reading with one of them, and I think she was three, and knew the whole book. And my dad was like, I cannot believe your kids can read a book like that. <laughs> I said, Dad, they're not reading. They memorized the book. I okay. said, but <laughs> they love the book, and they just knew when you turned the page kind what of what was going to come from next. the pictures they reading, but, but that's a literacy skill too it's right. a pre-reading skill absolutely oh, yeah. and they love that one book and sure. that they would say pop read the book and um, he just <laughs> that's great he thought that they were so smart and i'm like well they're pretty smart but they're not that smart <laughs> <laughs> my um father did a similar thing only he tried to shortcut the book because he was trying to get them to bed <laughs> and they called him right out uh -uh. <laughs> you skipped that's right <laughs> sure any questions, or can I move on to plumbing? <laughs> <laughs> move on to plumbing. OK. So I'm here as part of my um, stewardship for all things CTE. And so um, there will be a contract modification that will be coming forward. And really, Mr. Dixit will be the um, lead, because the majority of the contract um, is used as part of um, that side of the house. However, we do use plumbing supplies and equipment as part of our CTE programs. Um, and so we have um, plumbing supplies, equipment, and materials for CTE programs, including the plumbing program at Western Tech and Kenwood. Um, we also use them in the building construction and technology programs that are at Milford Mill, Eastern Tech, and Sellers Point. Um, Dr. Grubbs helped me to identify the different ways that they apply to our standards as part of the curriculum committee. Um, it's really important that you understand how we use these materials instructionally. So as part of our instructional program, um, we're helping students to identify the various types of materials, the ability to select materials as a part of their job, to properly and safely use tools. Um, all of the CTE purchases using this um, contract would be out of um, Perkins grant, but also with some of the operating part of the CTE office operating funds goes towards supporting the purchase of consumable materials. So obviously some of these materials, there'd be an ongoing cost associated with it. Um, Speaking of materials, some of the things we buy is various types of piping, um, copper or um, PVC there, and then specific adhesives, including rubber cement, um, as well as tools for cutting, measuring, and joining. I learned that this one is called a close quarter tubing cutter, something I never thought <laughs> I would know, but uh, now I do. So this, um, again, will be coming forward. And Dr. McComas asked me to um, alert you to um, the instructional use that will be a part of that contract coming up. Um, and then there is another contract that will um, be coming forward. I'm sorry. Yes. It was more of a statement. I've okay. used the close quarter, quarter tubing, tubing cutter, cutter, but I never knew the name of it. There you go. <laughs> Everybody learns. See, right? vocabulary matters. <laughs> yes, it sure does. Um, okay, so then the other um, CTE um, supplies contract that we will also be a part of, um, this one talks specifically about a lot of the CTE equipment and supplies that we'll use in multiple programs including advanced tech ed and some of our foundations of engineering. Um, you can see illustrated some of the different um, materials, some of the hand tools, sometimes power tools, et cetera, that are used part of that instructional um, program as well. So both of those contracts, I believe, are in the summer. Um, I think right now they're slated for July um, 9th. But again, Dr. Mercomas, um, while we don't get into the specifics of contracts per se, we just want an opportunity to talk about the instructional use as part of our CTE programming. Right. What I didn't want is for when it comes to contracts and then the full board, you know, it, it, I'm assuming that the exhibit will mention that these sure. resources for CTE programs are bought off of this contract and that you have an understanding of what does that mean? No one told me. So I wanted you, you'll be able to speak to your colleagues around, yes, we know that the, we do have plumbing programs in CTE and, um, and we do buy our PVC piping when the same contract that Mr. Dixit uses for facility maintenance and Question. Sure. Because um, my husband is in this business. Do we put these type things out for bid? Because I know just when we do a bid on a job, we don't always use the same supplier because for whatever reason, Bosley molding is cheaper on this job, but the mm -hmm. next time we use somebody else. Do we do that as these things come forward? For sure. So Mr. Saris will be in a better position at contracts to answer that. But what I can tell you is both of these contracts often have multiple award bidders in for exactly the reason you just stated. So a lot of them will have be awarded to multiple um, companies, if you will, to allow for just that, as you said, that variability. But he certainly will be able to speak to that more specifically.
Okay, um, thank you. But that's my understanding. And I believe on the contracts that have multiple bidders, I believe that's listed yes, as well. Mm -hmm. When I think about the ones that come, uh, often that originate in facilities that come forward, I think that uh, they're typically listed on there, all the companies that would be uh, related to that contract. Okay, okay so. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, great. So then the last part that um, I was going to talk about is this idea of novels. So outlined very specifically in policy in Rule 6002, we have a process in Baltimore County for how we select instructional materials that may be for county. Um, and part of the materials that we use in instruction in English language arts, but also in some of other content areas, is um, the idea of novels. Um, but as you know, in several other times I've come to talk um, at this board committee, I talk a lot about the importance of providing um, what we use um, to quote Dr. Rudine Seems Bishop, um, the idea of windows, mirrors, and doors. So we want kids to have opportunities to read about lands and peoples they'll never experience, those that look like them, um, and those that actually allow them to step in and experience, that's what we mean by the door, a different culture. Um, and to that end, it's important to us that in order to expand those opportunities for choice, we have a long list of materials that our teachers have available to them that they can use um, to provide that element of choice. So um, each year, we annually expand this list. We look at what's current, what's new literature, what are content topics um, that we know we want to expand on. We also collaborate with the Office of Advanced Academic Academics so that we can include titles that will be challenging. Um, when we evaluate texts, we use multiple measures. So the first measure that we use is a quantitative measure of text complexity. There are actual scales that measure how complex a text is, and we use that quantitatively to decide what's appropriately challenging um, or appropriately um, approachable for our students, or accessible, I should say. Um, but we also use qualitative measures. And what we mean by that is how well does it align to the standards and also to the theme or the essential question of that unit. Um, in addition, we look to how does it align in terms of interest? What are the students telling us that they want to read? Again, with that eye around uh, windows, mirrors, and doors. Um, we talk a lot in this committee and in the full board about our population of students um, and how it changes. And so it's um, important for us to make sure that the literature that we're reading reflects our students as well. And so I have um, for you a list. So as part of 6002, just to give you a brief update about the process, we bring together um, teams that are represented with a variety of stakeholders. So it largely includes teachers. Um, we do also have um, community stakeholders that participate. Um, they read the text using these different measures of both text complexity, but also appropriateness, alignment to standards, and interest. Um, and then we use that feedback to help us um, generate a list to bring forward. And so we do this process annually. Sometimes we'll come back once, if we um, have a new topic that's come up, um, say, for example, teachers have said, um, I really need additional nonfiction text to help support this science unit, that type of thing. Um, and then once we've selected those books, they're put out on public display. And in the same way, um, parents and community stakeholders and teachers can come and review the novels and then let us know if they have any concerns. Um, they're that actually, that process of a citizen's review of materials is open all the time. So we um, always have the ability for any citizen or um, community stakeholder, parent, teacher, et cetera. I actually have received a few from students um, themselves who will use that form to let us know of something that they either want to see in the curriculum or if they have a concern about something. And so part of having choice novels um, allows us to be flexible so that if there is a student who needs an alternate choice for a variety of reasons. We have several that align to those standards. Um, the resources that we have today, um, there are some titles on here, and I will pass around the list in a moment for you to keep. Um, this list includes titles at all levels, elementary, middle, and high. Um, they are um, will be presented as options that are then approved that teachers can use, but that also that curriculum writers can use. So none of these are currently in the, manda the um, Baltimore County curriculum, but they provide us options for future writing and also options for teachers to use in their classroom. So I'll pass around that list and then take any questions.
Oh, I'll pass the rest. There we go. Oh, Mr. Hoffman has one. Thank you. So as you're reading, you'll see an effort to expand to some um, diverse writers, um, including Kwame Alexander, Jacqueline Woodson. You'll also see some nonfiction texts, um, specifically with science and health. Um, and then as I mentioned, there are some titles there um, from advanced academics that we work in collaboration with them as well. I'm just, I'm curious. Did Neil deGrasse Tyson get himself in a little bit of a jackpot? Pickle? <laughs> um, sure, it seems that way. Yeah. Yeah. Was anybody aware of that? I mean, seriously. In terms of the social media stories about what we hear about him, is that what you mean? To the extent that you think this book shouldn't be on the list. Well, I don't. I don't know. I followed Neil deGrasse Tyson a little bit on yes. on a particular show, mm -hmm. right? And I think there was like a Me Too thing about him, wasn't there? I believe you may be right that there was an accusation made. What I will tell you that relates to this is that we have had occasion where um, there was an author or a topic of study. So one, for example, that happened years ago was with Mark McGuire. So Mark McGuire, we had baseball player. That we had a baseball player. He had been honored as a hero for uh -huh. baseball. We read a text about him, and then years later. He was um, involved in that start scandal. So that would be an example of when we would then take it for review. So if that's sort of where your thinking's going, um, I don't know that we would do it based on an allegation. Maybe. I mean, but but that is if that's the direction you're going, that if that were raised as a concern that um, either a teacher or a parent or a student was concerned about that, that would be an example of when we would use that process to review that. Yeah. And we bring the group back together. We review it in light of that new information, in light of all of the qualitative and quantitative measures I make it. And then typically, if we're going to remove something, um, then we make a recommendation to Dr. McComas as outlined in that policy. Again, I say, though, we do not have plans right now for this to be like a mandatory text. This is just an option that we're putting out there for choice. Yeah, and I don't even know if it should be reviewed. Sure. Right. I, I just was curious. I appreciate it. Yep, but that's, that's an that. example of um, how that might come up. Sure. A and sure. that's why we bring it to you for review and approval. Sure. Any other questions for me? Thank you. All right. This is one that I do need a, a voting process on. Oh, That's okay. And there is a back side, just so that you had a chance to see both sides. Oh, the back side just explains who's involved. Yeah, it just has the timelines of when we had it posted and, and all that important information. Thank you. You've had that, Gypsy? Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. And then I know Dr. Wisted and uh, Ms. Stansberry is coming forward um, to present on resources that you'll see contracts coming forward uh, related to Title I services and Title I funding. Yes. Um, we're just waiting for the slideshow to come up, but um, I can start by saying that the next few contracts that we have coming through are not exactly for instructional materials, but they are for services that we provide. So we thought this was a good opportunity um, to share what's happening. The first one coming up, uh, there's a requirement in our Title I grant that um, speaks about setting aside specific funds for students that are in institutions. We have about 230 students that we serve, and um, Ms. Stansberry is here to give the details of what our requirement is. Good evening. So um, the requirement comes not just from the state, but also from federal law that Title I Part A funds need to be set aside for students in neglected and delinquent institutions. Um, we, in our grant application, report how many students we're serving, how much money each institution receives, and we also report the types of services that will be provided to students in those institutions. 
In some institutions, students receive their academic school day program at the institution itself, and in others, they go to a public school and then receive additional services when they return back to the institution after the school day. The next slide will show you the four institutions that we have within Baltimore County. We provide funding only for Baltimore County resident students in those institutions, but there are other institutions, there are other students in those institutions from other counties. So Harford County provides funding to each um, of the institutions you see listed here, as well as Baltimore City. It depends on the resident. Um, location of that student at, at the particular institution. Allocations are um, given based on a per pupil allocation amount. So we take their October 31st um, student counts and we provide them with a PPA allocation for every year. Um, if you'd like, I can give you what those numbers are, but um, it's, it's really varies from year to year based on the number of students and and what we try to do is if the number drops drastically we try to adjust the PPA so that they're not losing and gaining significant services from year to year because that could be possible. So the services that we offer are instructional supplies and programs. We offer instructional support staff, extended day programs, social emotional learning supports, and staff professional learning. We pay the institution as a contractor um, the funding to provide those services. We have them complete a needs assessment every year, and we monitor the programs. We go out and take a look at what they look like throughout the year. And that's our institution program. So you'll be seeing a contract coming through, which is kind of like a memorandum of understanding so that we can share the funds as required with the institutions. Any questions? Yes. Do we provide teachers to those institutions? Um, some, two of the institutions use the funds, one for a reading specialist and the other one for a data coach and an and, um, academic instructional coach. Right. And just to be clear, those teachers aren't BCPS employees. Correct. They're employees of that institution. They just have, they use the federal funding Correct. to fund it. Okay. Absolutely. But like RICA, I attended the RICA graduation and there was a Baltimore County student who graduated from RICA. So that's, RICA's not part of this, I see. But that would be a situation where there's Baltimore County teachers assigned to RICA, correct? And then we, they service those Baltimore County students within that state program? Right, but that um, that's not part of the Title I funding. Right. The relationship we have with RICA is through our special ed um, non-public funding. Okay. But you are correct that there are FTE assigned to RICA as part of the partnership. Thanks. Sorry. I actually, um, I live one block from the children's home. It's my understanding that the majority of those children <coughs> Correct. And what, so this money is being used for services they receive in the children's home. Correct. So particularly at the children's home, they have an after-school tutoring program where students return to the institution at the end of the day, and they have one-on-one -on -one tutoring to help them with their homework and other long-term projects. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Time. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Oh, I, we do need to vote on that one. These are voting items. Okay, thank you. And then our next one is social emotional um, supports. Yes, so um, I'm here to talk to you again about services. This will be a contract you'll see coming through um, what we're calling our supportive and nurturing learning environments contract. Um, it's a contract that we have with, well, the proposed contracts with University of Maryland. So I just want to give you a little background regarding the federal title grants because the contract that's coming through will be a federal title grant that's supporting the contract. So we do have Title I federal grants that come through 
as Ms. Stansbury was up here talking about, we have uh, approximately $28 million in our Title I grant to support high poverty schools. So we do programs that are centrally based and we have school specific allocations that are given out to schools. The Title II program is one that is professional learning and it's supported both central office staff and school-based staff attend. The Title III program is uh, supporting our English learners. That's about a million dollars that we have. And the Title IV grant, which is what this contract will be using, is called our Student Support and Academic Enrichment Grant. And there's three parts to it. There's a well-rounded child part of the application, there's a safe and healthy student part of the application, and then there's a technology portion of the um, application. And the, gr the contract will be addressing the safe and healthy child portion. So um, what we are proposing to do with the University of Maryland is use the grant funds to pay consultants, behavioral consultants, to work with our Office of School Climate and those staff will support in our consultation, coordination, and professional learning for school staff as well as central office staff. Um, we want to increase our social emotional learning and mental health resources in an effort to sustain the um, professional learning. So a part of these consultants will be, and, and the relationship with the University of Maryland will be to train staff within BCPS to be trainers for some of the initiatives. So our Office of School Climate in 2017 was established. Um, the multiple offices that live within the Office of School Climate are our school psychologists, our school social workers, our school counselors, PPWs, our superintendent's designee, and um, a piece of that is the prevention piece, which is what this grant would address. We, again, want to partner with University of Maryland to hire consultants that will coordinate the efforts in the prevention portion. So some things that have been accomplished so far with the Office of School Climate and the grant up until now and previous grants with the University of Maryland is our youth mental health first aid. We trained 1,500 staff and 48 youth and adult instructors. We have community partnerships. We work with 17 different agencies to have 229 partnerships in 140 of our schools. We have a family navigation partnership where 310 referrals were made to the family navigation to connect families with outside resources. We have a classroom checkup. It's a strategy where the teacher does a self-assessment for different behavioral management techniques, and we have done that in 25 different schools. We have a restorative practices initiative where 500 and 80 staff have received, received training, and we have 32 staff that are trained to be trainers in restorative practices. And we have a conscious discipline initiative where we've trained teachers in kindergarten through grade three, um, and that will continue through the fall of this year. So are there questions about the services provided and our partnership with the University of Maryland? i just like to thank Ms. Uh, Dr. Wisted because she did a great job. This really comes out of the Division of School Safety and Climate, and but we wanted to make sure that, again, our job is to help make sure that things are coming before you, you have an understanding around. So thank you for shepherding our colleagues. Surely. Okay. Thank you. And then our final um, resource or service for this evening, uh, if we could get Dr. Sullivan to come forward, um, join Dr. Wistead. And okay, so um, as Dr. Sullivan's coming up, this is a, another contract that's coming through, and again, not specifically curricular materials, but this database is similar to what we currently use with our students that are receiving special education services. So it's aligned to um, being able to provide information on our English learners for classroom teachers as well as the ESOL teachers to collaborate with each other and um, 
they both this as just like our program with special education it um, aligns to our student information system and so they speak to each other for it Dr. Sullivan's going to give us some specifics about the database Okay, so there are two main functions of the database. Um, the first function is really to collect information that's specific to English learners, and this is information that we um, must provide to the state and the federal government every year. And then the second component is a strategies component, and the strategies component um, provides collaboration and professional development tools that we can use to support classroom teachers. So this first um, slide that you're looking at is an example of some of the proficiency data that the, uh, um, of our annual WIDA state assessment that we have to give. And so uh, if you look at this, teachers and administrators could easily see um, and understand the professional level, proficiency levels of their students. Um, so most impl importantly, what this database is doing is it's going to significantly reduce the time that ESOL teachers are spending on compliance data work. Uh, so that they can spend more time developing lessons, collaborating with their peers, um, and so the, the compliance piece becomes much more automatic and exact. Um, so here are some examples of some of the compliance paperwork that ESOL teachers complete every year. Um, the parent letters need to go out within the first 30 days of the school year, and then throughout the year, they ha it has to go out within 15 days. So if students enter um, later in the school year, which um, as we have students entering at all times, this can take a lot of time. Um, accommodations documents need to be completed every year as well um, within the first 45 days. Um, and so this information, because the database will store the information, will be able to be generated pretty much automatically, and we can also ensure that it's more exact than some of the paperwork we've, we've sometimes have. Annually. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, it, in addition, they'll generate these forms in parents' home languages, so if parents require a language other than English, um, Elevation has all of our top languages, um, which is kind of unique. A lot of, a lot of times um, systems will have some of our languages, but not all of them, but um, that was really important to us as well. All right. So this is um, an, another just example of how easily you could view some of the data that would then help really generate um, more data-driven instruction. So of course, looking at kids' proficiency levels, not just their overall proficiency levels, but their, their levels in listening, reading, speaking, and writing, really ESOL teachers need to see that and be able to generate um, their instruction based on the needs of each child in their classroom, and it can change very dramatically. Even if, a, if they have a class full of level two students, that, that student might have a level five in speaking and a level one in reading, so it's really important that they can see in a more detailed way where their students are so that they can make the best instruction possible. And then this is also a really exciting component. I, I've shared before that um, in the state of Maryland, there's no requirement for classroom teachers or content teachers to have any training, formal training on working with English learners. So this database will allow the ESOL teacher to go in and provide um, suggestions of strategies that they can use with individual students based on their proficiency levels and academic backgrounds. And this will be incredibly helpful for elementary teachers who are running from school to school, and so they'll be able to collaborate with their peers um, much more effectively. Mm. There, there. Uh, yes, great. Um, on the initial input of the data, is that the ESOL teacher doing that? No, most of the well. Most of the data will be generated from the ESOL Welcome Center, um, so the ESOL office staff. We enter all of the information we currently do too, um, on their language, their um, country of origin, all of that information, um, and their initial assessment. Then their annual assessment will be uploaded by DOIT. It'll be one like upload into our SIS, and then, as Melissa said, it would read over to this system. And if I am a student, um, who has to move from one school in BCPS to another school, is this a system-wide database, mm -hmm. or not just a school-specific database? System -wide. So any teacher anywhere could access this particular student's 
So once, so uh, you know, there will be um, security pieces so that when a student's in a certain school, they're oh, sure, teachers. Sure. But right. yes, as soon as they move, the, they'll be transferred over, and then their information will be transferred over, and it'll be automatic. Just like in our student information system, it, it would upload every 24 hours. So if they transferred the next day, it would be available at the new school. And are the letters that are available um, form letters, um, or does the ESOL teacher have the ability within the system to create a more um, tailored letter for whatever that student's particular needs are? So the compliance letters are not, teachers cannot um, modify those. So they come from the state. So Elevation actually works with, other state, with the state agencies to ensure that they have the most updated state um, letters, um, sometimes also local letters. And then they, um, put those in their system and translate those. So they wouldn't have that. It's, it's not like a letter just to say, um, like, your child is doing this. So they can't modify it. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, to your point, though, Ms. Uh, Mack, if, if a teacher needs to send a letter home to a family, they can work with, with our Office of ESOL and our translation mm -hmm. services mm -hmm. to generate a letter that says, I want to give you an update on how Mary's doing. And uh, so we could do, we could support teachers in that type of work um, as we already have been doing. This, again, is similar to the special education database, like the compliance letters, like the um, parent notification and the team summary. It's, so it's specific letters like that that are required by the state that are in this database. Thank you. I, I, the reason I asked the question, I had received an email um, about a particular school that had a lead, uh, high lead levels in the water, but the letters only went out in English, even though the area that the school was in had a very mm -hmm. diverse population. And I, I didn't know what what tools we had in place mm -hmm. to ensure that as many parents as possible could understand the implications of lead in the water. Right, so I will, um, that's it, like that letter was most likely generated, uh, originated from facilities, um, and that's one that I'll reach out and make sure that Mr. Dixon and team are aware of air translation services. I think that that's probably, in that particular case, not acceptable, but probably what happened. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Dr. Sullivan, I see your title as coordinator of Office of ESOL. Correct. Can I slip in an e a generalized ESOL question? Sure. <laughs> uh, the rumor's going around that ESOL is going to be decentralized from like Dundalk High School in, in Parkville, and those kids are going to be sent back to the their home schools to receive these services. Is that accurate? Let me talk about that. That's a really a question for the chief. Um, <laughs> so although um, I appreciate, uh, you know, Miss uh, Dr. Sullivan really is a tremendous expert. So first, let me say that decision has not been made. Is that a model that we need to consider? Absolutely. Because what, what we're doing is we're busing students. We're busing students. But not only that, what we see is that um, our elementary ESOL students go to their neighborhood school. So at the elementary level, they go to the normal school for their community. Then when we get to the middle school, we put them on a bus and we send them across town to a community they don't know, they don't live in, and then we do the same for the high school. Now that model that we currently had was put in place many decades ago, and our volume of ESOL students at that time was much smaller, right? So that made sense at that time because you concentrated services for a smaller population even though you really are dislocating them from their community. And they're already, in some cases, strangers in a new land. Um, and so what, when you, and you're well aware, because we talk about our data all the time, of our increasing student population around ESOLs. We're growing, is it close to 1,000 ESOL students a year? Um, and so the volume makes that model that was put in place decades ago really difficult to sustain because it, it puts strain on transportation, it displaces students from their communities. We have schools in some instances where ESOL families are choosing to forego ESOL support because they don't want their child getting on a bus and going 
miles and miles away to a place that they don't know and can't get to if their child needs help and support. And we know students who um, waive services, and Dr. Sullivan, jump in if I s explain this wrong, Students that waive services, they, families often feel like, well, we'll just figure it out, right? Um, they actually perform, it takes them much longer to acquire proficiency. And their proficiency goes down the year that they waive. So yeah. because each year, in order for your proficiency score to go up, you actually have to do much better. And so even if they flatline, their scores go down. So we'll, we'll see at the middle school level their scores will dip dramatically once they aren't getting service. Yeah, so I share that because I want you to understand that that is not a decision that has been made. It is something that we are looking at and it is something that I personally have spoken to principals about because what happens right now, and I will just kind of help add to this is that our ESOL students are our highest dropout population for the entire school system. And so when you think about, we put them on a bus, we send them to a place they don't live in and they, and they often can't access mm -hmm. participating in teams because they have to get on the bus to get back to their local community. They often don't participate in extracurricular activities because again, transportation. Um, is that um, it, when we look at that at the system level, the, the current model really is outdated for what our current context is around the volume of, of ESOL services and students. And, and the schools that are currently the centers, if you look at their data, their dropout data will show you um, compared to a neighborhood school, whereas if you have students in their community, and they were there as elementary students, but then as middle or high school students, they're shipped away, and then they're excluded from the opportunity to participate in all these things that anchor and connect students. You know, athletics is a huge, meaningful um, experience for students to stay anchored and connected, and for some students, athletics is really what motivates them to keep their academics <coughs> moving forward on schedule. Um, and so, unintentionally, our model really does, uh, does a poor job of serving our current needs in our current context. So I don't want to alarm people and that that decision is not made, but is really something that um, needs to be considered for the community and for the, the school system at large. And I, I have not shied away from having that conversation with our principals because I think they need to understand oftentimes our principals who don't are a principal of a center it's, it's kind of like ESOL is not my problem, but those ESOL students actually are your community. They just get bust someplace else. And we also have heard feedback from some principals where the kids are waving that they want help for those students because they've decided to stay and they are getting no service. Right, so the principal they're is struggling. Saying, even though they've waived services, the reality is my classrooms are being filled with students whose English proficiency is not really adequate, but because they're not a center, they don't get the resources. So we are examining how we can support them. I don't want you to think that we're doing nothing about that. But these are some of the things that are causing us to have to look at our current model and, and think critically about, is that model appropriate today for mm -hmm. our school system? Um, and, and if there would be modifications, how might that occur? And so how that we do a better job for all of those students. So. And, and just under the current model, when a student becomes for up to a proficient level, a certain level, then they are sent back to their home schools, right? Do cool. they have to wait till the end of the curriculum year, the calendar year to do that? So this is where I'll turn to Dr. Sullivan. And just if you would real quick hit on the levels of, we, of proficiency, okay. just as a frame. So students every year um, do take a WIDA annual proficiency, and the levels are one through six. Students exit the ESOL program, across, and this is a statewide um, exit rate, at a 4.5. We The students take the test in January and February, but we don't get the results until the end of May, so we don't exit students until the end of the school year. So they wouldn't move back until the next school year. Okay, and just curious, if, if Dunnock High School has 50 kids, and, and I'm guessing they're broken up in, by levels, mm -hmm. if they have 50 kids and just say two classes of, of the beginning piece of it, if they go back to their home school, if, if this is decentralized, mm -hmm. then you're looking at more staffing. 
Would well, you? Well, first, even in our current model, we need more staffing, as you're <laughs> aware of the budget process, and we will continue because uh, the way, um, let me just touch on, you know, if you think back to the budget process, the money that we um, ultimately get from the county, just even based on enrollment, not even thinking about specialized teachers like ESAW um, certification, is based on our September 30th en enrollment count. Many of our growth in ESAW occurs after September 30th. And that's actually, our budget is based on the September 30th of the previous year. So then we're already in the hole for all the growth of ESAW that previous year, and then any that comes in in that current year. So I share that to point out that we are constantly trying to dig out of the hole around ESAW staffing needs. Um, and so we, if, if, and we would not do this, but if we were to say tomorrow, students are gonna be educated in their community school, um, then the current staffing that we have would be out reallocated accordingly. And are there cohorts, like uh, ESOL cohorts with some of the local colleges to try to come up with more schools? There <laughs> yeah, are, aren't so again, there? again, this is where our true expert here. Come up, uh, can you, to come up with more schools? Like, you know how we're trying to create oh, more teachers, re recruiting correct. Okay. And, yes. and we have, certification? Mm -hmm. We have several cohorts every year. Um, the board's been approving cohorts. So we have um, cohorts at kind of all levels. So um, we'll have a cohort that is just a certificate. We'll have a master's level. Um, and so we work with Towson, Notre Dame, McDaniel. That's been in recent years. We've also worked with UMBC. So we have a lot, and we have a lot of teachers who are changing professions. So they're, in particular, in elementary, they want to become ESL teachers. So they're just they're going through the certificate route to then become um, an ESL teacher. So we. Especially for elementary, it's very easy to staff. Um, so secondary is more challenging, and so one of the, you know, we do need to look at maybe some other ways, like through alternative education programs, to bring um, uh, career changers in who really want to work specifically with this population. Maybe hadn't thought about teaching before, but now they're they're um, really empowered to help this population, and this is how they want to do it. And I think that will help in the long run with our secondary numbers too. Thanks for going off track on that. Thank oh, you. Oh no, I appreciate the question because I would I don't want misinformation out in the community and what's important is that you have uh, the understanding that when there's misinformation to clarify it and that you can also help communities understand, you know, they may live in one community where they're not realizing this is really a systemic issue um, and that you know, maybe they, in their mind, don't perceive that their community has any ESOL families, but that's because they're being bused uh, someplace else for the child's education during the day. So it's important that you understand this is a, um, a complex community issue uh, and not just simply a school-based issue. So. Uh, uh, a question, uh, somewhat similar to a mammy question I asked. Uh, when I was at Towson as a guidance counselor, we would have students sometime come in the middle of the year who were getting ESOL services, but because they were not in their home community, the family decided to bring them in. Mm -hmm. And they would come in in, you know, at whatever level they were at, but not, you know, and uh, it was a real issue. I mean, it was a really tough issue at that point. Because you had, you know, not only did you have the, the, uh, the, the ramifications of, of the level they were at, but also the whole scheduling mishmash for what was available at the school they were at, which mm -hmm. in our case was probably Parkville, different. if I recall, in, in, in mm -hmm. most cases, and then and then they ended up at, at Towson, and, uh, and we had the we had to you know make up a schedule that as close as we could, but yeah, and then of course we had no real use all service at all mm -hmm. that way. So uh, you know it's it's a real problem, and I, uh, Dr. Sullivan and I applaud, particularly in this, I guess it's almost a crisis situation in terms of numbers coming in and mm -hmm. and people coming in, and uh, you know I, I hope the board has has the foresight to uh, to really push to support. The, the resources that, that we uh, that that we need because this I doubt this is going to get you know it's not going to go away. I just want to think that way. Thank you. One of the things that we'll do um, is as we get into August and September, uh, we will invite you to visit our welcome center so that you can see firsthand. It's really uh, I think the best time to visit is September. 
August, September, and then again in February, we see a large uptick of, of new families coming in in, uh, in that January, February time frame as well. Um, if you go in a time where it's not quite one of the upticks, you may get to see one or two families coming into our, our school system. Um, but when you go in those high upticks, it really helps you get a feel for uh, the diversity of our ESAW um, influx, as well as all that we're uh, trying to do to help get them into our school system smoothly and swiftly so that we can make them feel at home and welcome and uh, help their children uh, do be successful. Um, and I know in the past we talked about the true differences among our ESOL. You know, we have some ESOL families who are coming and may be refugees and have spent years without education and have lived in refugee camps and things of that nature. But we also have ESOL families who have lived their life in the country, but their home language, their children's home language is uh, other than English. And their child is, you know, not proficient in English, even just to enter school. So. Uh, just sidebar on, on, a, on a visit to, to Lansdowne Middle, which has a huge ESOL population. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, very impressed in terms of what they were able to do there and, and were doing there. And very impressed that the, the ESOL population itself was very interested in learning about other cultures, which was a whole other thing that I never really considered. <laughs> you know, having for the first time in their lives exposure to people with, yeah. you know, different languages and different cultural backgrounds, it made it, it made it really interesting. And the principal was very clear that it, you know, it, that, you know, that's something that, that, that the, the students really were interested in. And he was trying to put together a, a, a programs that help to help them see, you know, the differences not just in coming to the United States, but in in terms of a, a, a global perspective. Mm -hmm. yep. Lansdowne, um, you know, is a good example of having a lot of diversity. So people often think of ESOL as Spanish speaking, um, but Lansdowne in particular has a lot of refugees as well, and they have many different languages and cultures, and it's a great place to be in the classroom, having them interact with each other. I wasn't aware until I visited there that there's a service and they have the use on some occasion because they would say someone comes from a place, well, you'd assume they have a lot. Well, they don't. Sometimes a dialect, mm -hmm. which, you know, our translators or the ones we have to be available aren't, aren't familiar with. So apparently there's a phone service that you can access. Language phone. Literally, the, I mean, can, so, you know, you got someone from a village somewhere in India or whatever country it is that, that you know, isn't, you know, it, it gives them a possibility of having a much better communication. Yes. So I, I think that's wonderful. And again, I, so many challenges, but uh, sometimes challenges bring out the best in people. Right. I think it's our ESOL um, population gives us a great opportunity to think about how to celebrate diversity and recognize the strength that diversity brings to our school system and our communities. Um, but there's also that slippery slope that sometimes uh, we can slide into othering, like those kids and those people. And, you know, and I think it, it really gives us a great opportunity to um, enrich our communities um, when we engage in it properly. So. Yeah. While we're conversing about this, I want to share, I was on our track at Chesapeake High School. A PhD guy from Alabama was walking our track. Him and I, I knew the man. We became involved in conversation. He asked me about the influx of immigrants that were taking away services from our kids, from the Essex Donda kids. And I looked at the man and I said, I embrace diversity. Yeah. Uh, and I really do. Mm -hmm. Because they had a wide range of enrichment to our our lives, our schools, our everything. And I looked at the guy, I said, I don't care if they've been here. And, and, and him and I, you know, I, it was a good conversation. But I said, I don't care if they've been here five days or, or, or they walked in this morning. They're now Chesapeake kids. They're Essex right, kids. Right. And whether they turn around and leave in six months, I told a kid, when, when a kid would say, Mr. McMillan, I'm leaving or something, I said, well, you take what you learned here with you to, to, to your next place. Right. And I believe that. And I think a public school system, we should embrace and engage our, our, everybody. Right. Thank well, you. I appreciate your leadership in the community because it does take all of us to champion that. And I just think about um, while I'm white and middle class at this point in my life, I think about the fact that not too many generations ago, my peop my own family were those immigrants who were displaced or chose to leave because of um, 
difficult situations in their origin country, and I think um, I want those families to have that same opportunity that my families were able to access two or three generations back. So, so anyway, I know I belabored the point. I'm very passionate about our students. Um, and on that, if we could have one, I think this is a final voting item, mm -hmm. and then we can call it a season. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. everyone. And this really concludes our curriculum committee for this school year. We do not have a meeting in the month of July. And our next um, curriculum committee, uh, the date was just approved this evening. And it is scheduled for August 15th. And uh, we'll pick up our work together then. Thank you so much. Yep, same bat channel, same bat station.